Hi everybody, uh, my name is Mike McGrath. I'm here to talk to you today about containers, uh, atomic, and best practices. There's been a few atomic talks already today. I'm hoping this won't be a lot of repeat. I've tried to go to them, but I'll emphasize some of the important pieces for those that aren't that familiar. And I'll also try to just emphasize the pieces that uh, are kind of complicated and tricky to, to understand. So. Uh, my background uh, at Red Hat is actually, I started as a uh, volunteer in the Fedora community. I was the Fedora infrastructure lead uh, back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth. And uh, then Red Hat hired me out to do that full time because they figured uh, that's probably a good idea. And uh, from there I went on to do OpenShift. And so I left Fedora to go to OpenShift and then I left OpenShift to come work on Atomic. And now I'm here uh, to talk to you about OpenShift and Fedora. So you can't really, you can't really escape your past as, as it turns out. So the topics today are just to go over the atomic universe. Uh, you know, we talk about containers and all this other stuff and just kind of Red Hat's view of it. Uh, we've got uh, the next section on just atomic and containers, just kind of make sure we're all speaking the same language and understanding what this stuff can do. And then we're gonna go over some deployment models and best practices. Uh, these are uh, more high level, but kind of help to help you better understand what you can do with containers when you're actually using them in a production environment. And before I go on, just a quick show of hands. Who here has ever tried uh, Docker or PCP? <laughs> it's a pretty good set of hands. That's a joke. I thought it was a funny joke. That stole from Mitch Hedberg. He's a professional. <laughs> so let's look at the atomic universe. So we've kind of got two communities right now. We're looking to better merge them or align them. Uh, in the beginning of the atomic universe, it was actually OpenShift. And uh, we went on to create uh, V1 and V2. V3 shipped very recently and it includes Docker and Kubernetes and all this other stuff. At the same time all that was going on, we had this uh, atomic project stuff going on in the background. I've got a timeline of that. And uh, I typically look at uh, OpenShift as combining a lot of these components together for a full DevOps uh, uh, view of things. But Atomic includes several pieces, include, uh, not just the, uh, the containers and things, but there's a lot of little tools that we'll go into. And a big part of uh, the Atomic Project is, of course, the Atomic Host, which today, uh, the Atomic Project, or Project Atomic, produces uh, three different varieties of hosts, actually four is kind of what we're targeting. Uh, one of them, obviously, is out in Fedora. Uh, it's produced with the, the Fedora team. A lot of people work on that. We're working on two different releases, sort of, in the CentOS world. One of them is exactly what you'd expect from CentOS, some sort of downstream build of the Rel Atomic Host. We're also looking at one that moves a little bit more quickly, something that is a little bit more stable than Fedora, but a little bit faster than uh, RHEL Atomic uh, Host, and uh, you know that we're, we're trying to get that together because we think that's a you know I think that's a compelling thing to be doing. Uh, Fedora tends to be a bit more leading edge than some people would like, and then obviously we've got uh, RHEL Atomic Host. That's the thing that uh, puts uh, food on our table, and so it is a fully supported product at this point. On the OpenShift side of that, uh, that tends to be our paths, and it's kind of, the, the reason that there's a lot of confusion, at least internally at Red Hat about these things, is because uh, there's not really an apples to oranges comparison between what Atomic, uh, Project Atomic is doing and what OpenShift is doing. Sure, there's containers in both, they're both using Docker, they're both using Kubernetes, but they are very different. And so OpenShift is Red Hat's full on paths, and the OpenShift guys produce uh, three different varieties right now. One is OpenShift Online, which you can actually just go to www.openshift.com if you have an email address or you want to go invent some fake email address. You can, that's all you need. You can just log in, you get some apps, you can build them. It's a great, great little service. We have OpenShift Enterprise, which is more of a Red Hat's traditional business model where a customer can come in, download the bits, install them on their system, and run them all nice and easy. And then there's the upstream community project, which is OpenShift Origin, which mostly exists out of GitHub, but it has all those pieces that you'd expect if you wanted to build this on your own, on something like Fedora or CentOS. So uh, at the summit, we announced this new project, or new, I guess a new product called Atomic Enterprise Platform. And it kind of sits in, in between these two pieces. And the way that I like to describe this is Atomic Host, I think most people get, it's a containers-based operating system, and I'll talk more about the details of that. Uh, but it's got Docker, Kubernetes, and a few other things that you need to get going with a, with a deployment. Atomic Enterprise Platform takes those things and automates a lot of pieces of it. Uh, it uh, allows for a larger dis uh, deployment of Atomic Host that can be across several different systems, has all the stuff you need to tie stuff in and have a whole bunch of automated pieces. 
the thing is different, uh, the thing that then goes further with OpenShift is it adds those development features. And so on the developer side, if you have developers that are gonna be pushing to prod, or if you have, uh, want to do a full DevOps model, uh, that, you know, we recommend you go straight to OpenShift. It's got all the build tools, it's got integrated CI, all this other stuff. And so over the next several slides, I'm gonna kind of dig into each of these more closely. So Atomic Coast, as I mentioned, it, all this stuff is very new. So, you know, they're, they're, it's understandable why there would be some confusion about this. We launched the, the uh, Project Atomic back in April of 2014, which is really not that long ago in the grand scheme of things. Uh, by the following December, uh, it had been put into Fedora 21, and then the following March, which was just a few months ago, was when we GA'd the product. Now, um, a Red Hat timeline, that is, that is lightning fast. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you're going through it, it, it kind of feels very chaotic at the time. And so the big thing about Atomic Host that's very different from a standard REL host is that it's, uh, it, it's got this core piece of technology called OS Tree. And uh, this is Colin, uh, the guy that uh, invented OS Tree, who I thought was supposed to be here. Has anybody seen Colin around? I thought he was supposed to be here. That's fine. So, uh, Kyle mentioned OS Tree, and I asked him for a quote, and he was gracious enough and gave me this quote. OS Tree was born to help implement a continuous delivery model for operating systems. One can be a lot more confident about updating systems if one knows that a reliable rollback system is always available. And this is really the core, the core feature of Atomic Host. And I guess just a quick show of hands, who here has installed or booted or tried an Atomic Host of some kind? Most everybody, not everybody. So I'll go over some of the differences here. And this, this slide right here really just outlines it. So you boot your atomic host and you log into it. If you type yum update, you're going to get a command not found. Yum is not even on there. It's not because we replaced it with something newer either. It's because it's not on there. Uh, it's largely a read-only file system. You cannot add packages to it uh, very easily. There's a lot of things that you get locked in. The whole point of the atomic host is that you're supposed to be running things in containers. And so the containers are the way so you'll bring down new features and things. And uh, as Dan will be quick to point out, you know, a lot of the advanced features you might need from an administrative point of view would be done in SPCs. But even with all that, you're still not going to be logging in and making a lot of changes to the underlying file system. However, there, if you do want to do an upgrade and a downgrade, you use Atomic Host Upgrade, which will pull down all the information you need, get the system ready, but then it'll sit there. You'll still be on the old version until you reboot into the new version. And an atomic host rollback will then let you roll back to the previous version. Again, a reboot is required. So this is a very drastically different way of managing a system. But as you look at uh, you know your your cattle versus pets argument, it's a really great cattle argument that you can just boot up these new systems, bring them up and down. You know what state they're in because they're all identical, minus the actual configuration pieces. So uh, atomic enterprise platform. So a little bit of a this this arrow goes across here. It's pretty close to them. So uh, Atomic Enterprise Platform, when you want to install this and get several nodes across, uh, has, uh, from the usability point of view, uh, has uh, an OC client tool and a cockpit tool. And both of those go through the API to contact an Atomic Master. And the Atomic Master is a Kubernetes host. These are typically run on their own, so it's got Kubernetes, and that's going to be whatever you would need to have in there, along with SkyDNS for service discovery. And it also has a few extra API pieces that we use for deployment and some of these other items. So you would use, typically you use cockpit, or I'm sorry, you use OC tools to then contact your atomic master <coughs> to tell it what to do. Uh, at that point, the atomic master would go out to your node farm uh, of the atomic nodes, and this would be the bulk of your environment if you're running anything significant. You'd have lots of atomic nodes out there, running containers all over the place. And on these atomic nodes, we actually ship a few containers already that help integrate this environment. So in, in an Atomic Enterprise Platform environment, we have an HTTP router, which is based on HA proxy. Uh, we have a Docker registry that's integrated. So obviously, if you have a large environment, you don't want to constantly go out to a Red Hat registry or a Docker registry to download things. You may want a local mirror. That's what you can think of as your local mirror, that Docker registry. And then we have a special deployment config uh, that allows you to do specialized deployment uh, artifacts, which a lot of this stuff is actually going to get merged back into Kubernetes. We try to be good citizens, so that stuff will all end up in Kubernetes, and you won't need the specialized container for it anymore. <coughs> OpenShift adds a bit to that. So there's an integrated UI with OpenShift that adds uh, an application view of, your, uh, of what you're trying to do. And it also adds some additional API calls to the master. And then the two, the two big ones, 
the, really the, the big differences are we have uh, continuous integration that is built in that runs inside the platform itself, and there's also a source to image builder. So if you're a developer and you have some sort of code of some kind, you want to get that stuff all built and tested, OpenShift has all of the tools that you need to do that out of the box. Whereas Atomic Enterprise Platform kind of assumes that someone else is doing that already. Either your developers have created an image and sent it to you, or that you're going to be building it somehow outside the system. And also, a lot of people already have CI, so you know they may not want to move to OpenShift unless they feel it's becoming too complicated to maintain. <clears throat> so before I move on, any questions just generally about what OpenShift does and is targeted at, DevOps stuff, what Atomic Enterprise uh, is targeted at, which is uh, container orchestration for traditional operators, or what an Atomic host does, any questions? Okay, so let's move on to Atomic and containers. This is some one-on-one -on -one stuff to make sure we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, it should go pretty quick. So <clears throat> when you're gonna containerize something, typically you take something like an application, you throw it into your Docker container, and, and then you run it. And that can be moved around this way or that. It's, it's very simple. Uh, we typically talk about this in terms of microservices, meaning that it's not generally a good practice to be cramming this whole large stack with your HTTP server and PHP in there, and, you, and you're also gonna throw MySQL in there and Memcache. You don't tend to want a large monolithic uh, container because they don't scale very well. They're kind of unruly to work with. And so the idea is with containers, you can break them all out into small pieces here and there. A lot of good best practices. I think most people are familiar with when you go into an actual container build, uh, <clears throat> which is taking what that previous slide was and actually doing it in some sort of reproducible fashion, uh, you'll do that with a Docker file. And this is just a sample Docker file. Um, if you have any experience building kickstart files or anything like that, building a Docker file uses uh, that same part of your brain uh, to, to build these files. Uh, one thing that some people get confused about is that you can actually boot an image, make some changes to it, and then run Docker commit. Uh, I generally recommend against that you lose the reproducibility. Uh, the analogy for those of us that are packagers would be, we just imagine if you could actually log into the build server while it's building and make changes <coughs> and log out, you'd give Dennis a heart attack. So, <coughs> so generally you just want to use the, the Docker file to, to build these, these images. And so the, the, I'll just point out, you know, basically this pulls a basic Fedora image in, it runs Yum install HTTP and Ruby, uh, I've added some local Files and things, I'm going to expose port 80, nice and easy. Then I'm going to build the image, which it builds from Fedora, pulls the pieces down, builds what it needs to, and then I'm going to tag the image. So that's the basic workflow. <coughs> I'm going to tag it and specify what registry it's going to go to, and that will throw it into an actual registry. Which brings me to what a registry actually is. So if you haven't looked at, I mean, I think most of us probably looked at Docker.io, it's just a registry, there are several of them. <coughs> Red Hat has its own certified registry. You're also welcome to run your private registry, which I suspect most people will be doing in any sort of enterprise environment. You'll sort of take these images, hopefully certified images from Red Hat, but if you want us to go hungry, you can also use the Docker.io images, and then uh, you can try those as well. But uh, the Red Hat certified images are at least groomed and things like that, and I think Fedora is going through a lot of the Fedora images to try that too. The real trick is that on the upstream Docker images, there's not really any certification process. They've got some official images and things, but it's pretty wild west out there, which is great. You can upload whatever images you want to up there, but at the same time, uh, that makes it, you gotta be careful all you're consuming from that upstream place. <clears throat> and so, basically what I've done here is just, you can, once it's in the registry, you can run a Docker run on any one of your atomic hosts, and it will pull down the image from your registry and go from there. Now, where, where we're at in this process is, I've described how to build a Docker container, I've described how to upload the Docker container, we've explained that Docker run runs the Docker container. The next problem is, well what happens if this is highly, su highly successful and you're running tons of Docker containers? That's where Kubernetes comes in. And so Kubernetes is an orchestration framework that allows you to describe an application and all of its micro components and uh, pull, uh, it basically uh, orchestrates several, uh, several applications each that could have several different containers and allows you to just tell it what to do and it'll do its best to make sure the environment looks like that. And I've got an example in here. Uh, but Kubernetes has some built-in routing. It has easy ways to expose these images. It has ways to auto-recover. Uh, it's got pretty much all the things you're going to need to run uh, lots of containers in an individual environment. And uh, Kubernetes, if you're not familiar, it was built by Google. Uh, Google has their 
their level seven Google wizards uh, building uh, Kubernetes and Go. It's under rapid development. Out of all of the components that we're going to talk about today, Kubernetes is the newest, uh, and in my opinion, the most exciting part of this. Uh, it's going out of rapid changes, but it's all very good stuff. And, and it's been very exciting to work with. And so, just a quick example of what you could expect from Kubernetes after you've described your application to it, is that it has this whole health check system. And so if you have a specific container uh, that goes bad, and, and in Kubernetes they're called pods. A pod could have several containers, but generally, conceptually, if you're not familiar with it, just think of a pod as a container, and that's fine. So if one of your pods goes bad, Kubernetes will notice that, try to kill the pod, and bring it up in a new location. And this is exactly what you would expect to have happen uh, from a monitoring system. It's just that it's built into Kubernetes. So it's not like you have to have some separate monitoring system checking out all of your containers and trying to decide if they're up or not. Kubernetes is doing that for you. And the thing that's nice is when you set all that stuff up, you've actually told Kubernetes uh, through a series of JSON files what your application or several applications are supposed to look like. And so you've got, this is a, just a, a snippet from a sample service that it pulls the uh, WordPress HTTP down. You can see that uh, it's got the names up, it tells you what ports are gonna be in there. It's a very basic language that uh, is really easy to control and manage with something like Git. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great little interface. So. Uh, the next step of this, before I get too much further, is I want to really uh, nail home this link uh, of the container workflow and the atomic workflow, how, uh, how much they have in common, uh, but also in comparison, compare those workflows to the traditional YUM workflow. And so uh, if you're going to look at an update scenario or a deployment scenario, which is what we're going to go over next, uh, you know, YUM, basically the idea is how do you get from version one to version two? Version one at time to version two, same thing with Docker. So let's look at these deployment scenarios. <coughs> like I said, version one to version two, very simple. So let's look at a traditional sort of YUM update scenario. You've got your set of servers off in some server farm in the middle of nowhere, and everything's running fine, and a developer comes up and says, hey, we want to, we've got some new code to deploy. And so with a YUM update in a traditional environment, and you may have orchestration doing this, but still somehow in here, what's going to happen is you're going to run YUM update on your systems. Maybe all at the same time, maybe one at a time, but it's going to work like this. So you've got some server in transition, you're going to run YUM update, and boom, it'll be on version 2. And then you'll keep going until the rest of your servers are all in version 2, and then you're, up to, you're ready to go. Now, this is the way I've done things for over a decade, and I think most people are familiar with this workflow. But the problem is what I call the traditional failure. And many a Christmas Eve's have been, have been ruined by these sorts of failures. And so what the, the, the real issue is, what happens if you're in the middle of a deployment like this, and the, one of the systems you're working on, YUM update, or whatever your deployed code is going out, what if that fails, what do you do? Your options are not very good. Uh, rolling back RPMs, I mean, they kind of have it, but I've always experienced that to be a pretty shitty solution. Uh, or what, you know, what if you have to get a developer on the horn to say, hey, you know, we're, we're doing this update for whatever reason. This one still had old libraries on it, uh, and it's very confused. We don't know what to do at this point. Uh, you know, now we're, we're getting uh, database calls that are bad, all this other stuff. You're really in a bad, you're really in a bad situation when you're, when you're, if something goes wrong with the traditional update cycle. So, uh, let's take a look at red-black deployments. I think these are also basically called green-blue. I think there may be some argument the difference between the two. I think they're about the same. Um, I first started learning about red-black deployments from Netflix. This is how they do things. It's very fancy. So, let's say you've got your load balancer up and everything's running, you're on version two, your developer shows up and says, hey, I've got this great new code to deploy. Uh, please deploy it for me. And so, this deployment works a lot differently in that uh, when you start bringing up version 2, you bring up an identical side scenario in version 2 until it's entirely up and running. During this entire time, everything on the production side, your deployments, your load balances, we're also ver uh, serving version 1. Your users are completely unaware that version 2 is even out there anywhere. And this allows you to have your QA go in and test. You can have your developers test. You can go through and test a whole lot of scenarios to make sure that version 2 is ready to go. And when everybody gives a thumbs up, you flip the switch, and now everybody, now your users are using version two, and you shut down version one, and you're good to go. This is a, a really great way of making sure that the environment is going to function as best as it can, but there are still some issues. 
So one of them is, for example, is I've seen this done with DNS, and so you know if you or even a really lazy or poorly managed load balancer. So let's just say you do try to do this with DNS. You got your version one and version two up. You've done all of your testing again on version two, and you said, hey, we're ready to go. So uh, hopefully someone the previous day has said, okay, if we're going to do a DNS uh, change, we'll set the TTL to 60 seconds, and for a little bit we'll serve both both of them at the same time. And once that 60 seconds is up, the theory is that version one will no longer be used because DNS is amazing, except it's not. DNS is terrible. And if anyone's ever been in a scenario where, where you've done this, you, you've definitely seen that even after that 60 seconds, version one will continue to get served, sometimes for hours afterwards. And one of the big reasons for that is because the way clients choose to implement DNS uh, and name resolution is not, uh, not as standard as I think we would all like. Some of them don't bother looking at the TTL. They don't look up the DNS entry again very often. <clears throat> and so if you have you know, some sort of mobile app that is contacting your application, it may very well not realize that the change has happened. So this is just one of the pitfalls of a red-black deployment. But there are good pros and cons, right? So uh, some of the good pros, this will catch production users or production issues before the users ever hit it. That's always nice. Uh, there's no rollback required, really, because if version 2 is having any issues, you just shut the thing down. Version 1 was untouched the entire time. You're not really going to be in an unknown state where you have half your servers on version one, half on version two, and maybe a few of them that died halfway through that are in some completely unknown state. The cons, though, are, are also uh, a lot on this. It's expensive, right? At some point in time, you're going to have to double your infrastructure. You can do this during an off time if you want, but you pretty much still have to plan for a peak time or at least downtime because if there's some sort of zero day or emergency deployment, if you're using the bulk of your uh, environment, you either have to choose to take some of it down and, and take users off, or you just have to take the whole thing down and, and do the update that way, which it can take a long time to do. Uh, monitoring is also very tricky in this scenario. Depending on how you're doing monitoring, you may have temporarily brought up double the amount of uh, environments that you have, the host names and things, uh, and then suddenly you're going to bring them down, you have to remove them. Depending on your monitoring solution, adding and removing hosts can be tricky, especially the removing part. Uh, you need to automate it. The router flipping, the whole thing when you're on version one, you need to move to version two, uh, making sure that that actually functions right, especially if you want to try to do that with some sort of bleed over where customers aren't getting cut off mid-transaction or anything. They're going to need to move, and uh, that can be tricky to do depending on the router you're using. Uh, also, depending on what sort of uh, storage you're using, if you don't have some sort of shared storage file system and you're using local cache or local storage on those systems, that can also be very tricky, especially if these are entirely different environments or entirely different hosts. And finding scale issues can be tricky. Um, you know, your Kiwi can do the best job that they can, but if you bring that new version up and there's a, a slow algorithm of some kind or you've uh, uh, forgotten some sort of index or something, it's gonna be painful to, to track down because it's, everything is there, they're getting the, the it's getting the load that it, uh, it's getting the, the full load of the environment and so your options are kinda of like, you might be able to flip back for a little bit, it's tricky. So. Let's take a look at rolling deployments. And this is what I have typically done in the past, at least before uh, clouds. Uh, rolling deployments are basically you have your load balancer up and everything is serving fine. Your pesky developer comes in and says, hey, I have a new version, so you release a new version. And so you take one of the, uh, one of the systems out of your load balancer, you update it, and now it's on version two, and you can move on to the next one to version one. You can even start going more at a time or do some sort of uh, increase, uh, ever increasing number. If you have a huge environment of several thousand hosts, you can do one, two, four, eight, you know, you can go up to 100 at a time or 200 at a time until eventually everything is on version two. Now, uh, if you go back and look, this is a very odd scenario because this won't always work with a lot of applications. Uh, you're, set, you're certainly in an environment, I think, at this point in my example, where some users were getting version two, some users were getting version one. For many types of updates, that's totally fine, especially cosmetic updates and things like that. Uh, so there, there, there are certainly uh, several good options in terms of, of doing rolling deployment, but there's a lot of cons as well. So let's take a look. The pros, this is the cheapest way to do deployments. You don't need to have double your capacity at any point in time. You can also typically find performance issues early because all these systems are getting performance or production level load. So any of those early systems, if they start falling over, you can halt the deployment to take a look at what's going on instead of continuing to move on. <coughs> this is a pretty common workflow. I would bet most of us have tried something like this in the past. 
uh, with an update. This works really well with local storage. If you have storage on the actual system without some sort of shared environment, you can basically reuse the hosts that are there. This is really great for gigantic environments where you need to do just a few at a time. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't expect Google to have a complete copy of their environment at any point in time. Maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, so there's still a lot of co uh, cons, though. So I mentioned the unknown state concerns. You've got situations where uh, some users may be serving, uh, getting uh, code from multiple versions of the environment. Uh, you can use sticky sessions for this if you want, uh, but you know it's, there's a consideration that you need to look at. If you do get through partway through the deployment and you decide that this is not working out, then obviously you need to do a rollback of some kind. And so you're going to have to go back and find the versions that have been updated and roll them back to version one. Uh, and this also requires some sort of integrated health check to happen on each one of the individual hosts, which is always a good idea, but you're going to want to make sure that the health check is working very well. Uh, so, you know, for example, if this was a JBoss application, you can't just check to make sure that the TCP connection is open because JBoss will take a little bit longer to actually deploy the application. So you actually have to have some sort of health check that can then go in and make sure that the actual node will respond with 200s instead of errors, and there's a lot of ways to do it, but it's something you've got to be careful of. So pros and cons, you know, different uh, different applications, but two perfectly valid deployment scenarios. So the hard one, data migrations. So obviously, I think the, the data migration story has always been the hardest part for me, um, especially with OpenShift Online. So I can give you an example when uh, when our team ran OpenShift Online, we would do new deployments. I think yeah, I'm not in here. I think that uh, by the time I left, we were doing about a, de a deployment one and a half times a week, which is not the seven billion times Netflix deploys every day, I already know, but it's not bad for an enterprise company. And the, the, the real trick is with data migration is because if you have any sort of update that requires some sort of schema change or data uh, migration or anything like that, uh, there's this critical point in the upgrade where once you start doing that migration, uh, unless you have some sort of fallback plan, which uh, is often very expensive to write if you're going to do some sort of demigration, <laughs> that uh, if you find any errors at that point, you kind of just have to power through, and it's rough. Uh, my recommendation for those of you that are looking at doing this sort of scenario in your environment is to decouple data migration updates from regular updates. And so, and a lot of enterprises do updates once every three months or every three years, uh, whatever, it, uh, whatever it actually is. Um, if you have some sort of data migration in that, I would recommend decoupling that part of the migration and doing it separately. There's a lot of reasons for that, one of which is that, uh, one of which is because data migrations can take a long time, but also it's easier to help know when something goes wrong. So if you've got you know, 25 patches that you're gonna deploy, and one of them ends up causing a, uh, some sort of performance issue, which one was it, right? You, you do typically wanna break these up uh, so you can help find things like that. And so the, uh, to, to, to help illustrate this is, in this scenario, let's go back to the, the rolling update scenario, if you have um, some of your uh, systems on version two and some version one, you got to shut them down. Well, which version of the schema is it expecting? You know, it, it just it can be uh, kind of a pain to, to go through and try to figure out. So <coughs> I just want to, uh, to, I've got a few more things here and I wanted to open up for questions. We'll see if there are a lot. Um, so just, to, we covered the atomic uh, and overshift ecosystem. I know this is still very confusing. Uh, I hope I have. <coughs> I have alleviated some of it, you know, where OSHA and Atomic are very coupled to each other because of the common container background. Uh, I think that uh, OpenShift is kind of now more considered part of the uh, product Atomic container ecosystem, so uh, that's always good. Uh, we covered a little bit about Docker containers and Kubernetes. Um, I, I wanted to put a demo together, but I know better. So uh, <laughs> there's also plenty of, uh, of, of options out there. There's a lot of videos, and hopefully, those of us in this room, at least, uh, if they want to have the wherewithal to go do that sort of thing. And we covered at least two deployment scenarios with red, black, and rolling deployment. Now, uh, there's also several others. You should go out and see and compare with what your applications look like and see which ones work for you. But I do have four challenges for you if you're just getting your feet wet and you're not sure where to start and what to do next. Challenge number one, uh, I would encourage all of you to go back, find some critical component of your extra infrastructure, just some small microservice, but something that's in production, uh, something that's out there, and just containerize that thing. Containerize it, try to get it out to production in that environment. You can leave them both up if you want. You know, if you've got it behind a load balancer, put some of them behind containers, some of them not. But it's a good way to, to get the feet wet and get other people familiar with what's going on there. Uh, it's also a very non-intimidating way to learn how your monitoring is gonna work, or in most cases, not work with containers. 
uh, and, and try to find some of those policy-driven items that are going to need to change while you move to a containerized environment. Challenge number two, once you have that deployment, uh, once you have that small piece uh, deployed, try to get uh, enough that you have an actual application deployed uh, onto an atomic host. So go out, you can run atomic, uh, uh, you can run Docker obviously on any sort of uh, Red Hat operating system, atomic host or otherwise, but try out an atomic host, do it that way. Then once you have enough containers to warrant a full application, go try Kubernetes. Um, you can actually get a supported version of Kubernetes with atomic host in rel, but if you're Filling up to it, you can always try a community version and go that way. And once you have Kubernetes uh, deployed, then go and take that next step and look at Atomic, uh, the Atomic Project, Atomic Enterprise Linux, or OpenShift. And so uh, remember, just you know, if you're trying to figure out which one's right for you, if you have developers that are going to be pushing code to prod, or you have developers that you want to uh, add CI to and all the other stuff, integrated builds, give OpenShift a try. That may be the first place you want to go look anyway, just in case. But if you happen to have integrated CI already uh, elsewhere in your environment and you have a very strong line between your developers and your production people or perhaps you're in the finance industry, uh, it would be illegal to, for your developers to push abroad. Take a look at Atomic uh, Enterprise Platform. That may do what it needs for you. And so with that, I'll stop and I'll see if there's any questions from anyone. Yes? So we should have online use Atomic on the hood. OpenShift Online, okay, so OpenShift Online is still on V2, and so uh, we're working hard to get V3 out. Uh, if you're wondering why V3, so uh, in the past we had done OpenShift Online first, and that was where everything went. We flipped it for V3 because we had a lot of customers and people that wanted to get Docker environments out as fast as they could, and believe it or not, it's uh, the hard parts of V3 uh, after Enterprise are things like integrating with RHN, like we have single sign-on with RHN, uh, and the big one is billing. So we have a full-on credit card billing provider uh, that takes a lot longer to get ready. And so we didn't want to block the enterprise release. But uh, the, I would expect that, you know, probably in the next several months we'll have something out. Uh, there'll be a beta that you can go out and try. The OpenShift Online team does have Atomic Enterprise hosts uh, out there running in production, but they're not supporting the actual OpenShift install. They're, they're more on things like the reverse proxy servers and some of those other uh, dependency pieces. Yes? Uh, is there any kind of uh, best practices or, or any ideas of how to split up a traditional app into a microservices for containers? Or, I mean, obviously that's a tough, it depends on what it is, but you, like you mentioned, you don't want to put a web server, PHP, and a database server all in the same container. You want to split that up, and there's some lines, but is there any kind of like best so, practices? Yeah, I, I think, so there's not a definitive guide or anything. If you're up to writing an O'Reilly book or a white paper, I'm sure they would be amenable to that. Uh, I think that the issues that we run into are a lot of new or greenfield deployments are being done in Docker. It's much easier to start from scratch than it is to retrofit. Um, having said that, if you're just getting started and you're serious about using Docker containers, and there are actually a lot of really good reasons to move to Docker besides trying to utilize microservices, um, if you're in the environment, I mean, you know, a monolithic container is not going to kill you, uh, especially if you're in a, uh, uh, this has come up several times from customers in the education field where you have a centralized IT department and several other ancillary groups that are kind of handing applications over. It's a lot easier to just consume that via a container if you can convince them to put it in, even if it is in a monolith. A lot easier to pass that container around than it is a virtual machine, especially since sometimes you won't even have access into the virtual machine. Um, but in terms of the best practices, there is a little bit more that you can do if you want to go look at pods. I touched on this briefly. But you are going to be in uh, scenarios where, for example, you may want to have some sort of application server that needs to be co-located or at least very, have very fast access to a memcache server. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you have 20 of each and they're, they're, you know, they don't share memcache for whatever reason. Uh, with Kubernetes and pods, you can have multiple individual containers that exist on the same system on that same pod. And so there, there, are, there really are some exotic uh, application scenarios that you can look at, which is, is helpful. Yes? Okay, so when you, you know, with micro, microservices and taking the app as a container, there's a huge risk at how to differentiate creating a clusterfuck of, <laughs> you know, a huge massive microservices thing that all of a sudden then you're stuck X amount of months down the track to try and keep all that up and nobody really knows what's going on, etc. Do you have any recommendations and best practices around how to avoid that scenario? Like going microservice crazy? Yeah, 
and so and here's, here's a really good example of that. So what's, what's the difference between two really big bare metal servers running a quote microservice versus, versus you know, 100 tiny ones that are spread across several of them? Uh, in terms of preventing the clusterfuck, I think you could look at, uh, I, I think a big part of that is, con is properly controlling the application definitions at the Kubernetes layer. So at a minimum, you have a, you have a history and you have some sort of control point, uh, control point there. Now, uh, as in terms of running lots of these uh, little pods, I think that you know, if, you, if you end up in, the, the, the trick is, the, this isn't gonna solve problems that other environments would have. So if, if you've got a lot of bit rot in your virtual machine environment, for example, and you don't make any policy changes, you may end up with the same situation in containers because it doesn't solve those kind of problems. Uh, but if you, as an operator, or as, even as a developer, uh, if the developer is owning these application definitions, you should be okay with something like Kubernetes because you can always destroy the application. You know, it's not like these, these pods are going to get left over or you're not going to end up with uh, sort of orphaned virtual machines. And uh, so I think that they're, they're, the, the tools themselves will help alleviate some of that, at least. I think they will. I'm not saying Kubernetes is easier. Launch your pods through a, like a replication controller in Kubernetes if you plug your use and say, oh, it's not, you know, and it's just a different learning. You know, if you need to take all those pods down simultaneously, you can say, replication controller, scale down to zero, and you won't have it. It'll make sure it gets rid of all those, so you don't have to worry, oh, you know, I left one running over there. Uh, and it does tend, it does, Kubernetes does tend to be smart, but like I said, it's also the newest piece of this, and so. Don't go expecting the world yet, but it is it is at least supportable, and Red Hat has put their full GSS support behind it. So, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned this struck a different subject, but you mentioned that containers break your you mentioned containers kind of break your monitoring. Do you mean just like agent based monitoring, or like what? So what, what <coughs> is the difference there? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Uh, Zadex was a big monitoring tool that we used in OpenShift Online. And so let's just, you know, typically you want to, let's just say you want to check and make sure that HTTP is running. So you've got a PID to check, you've got two ports that you want to make sure are running, you want to make sure that the SSL certificate is not expired, you want to make sure it's responding within a certain amount of time. And so to, to, to do that, you can, uh, on a traditional virtual machine, that's all very simple, you just run a single command and you're good to go there. Yeah, uh, let's just say though that, for example, on a Docker system or uh, an atomic host, you don't even have HTTP on that host. You may not have the, the tools to even do a curl against it. They're just tools that might be missing. So at that point, you have to go into the Docker container to get that information, uh, which is kind of like running everything in sudo. Okay, so I can kind of conceptually understand that. Now I've got the sort of Docker wrapper command that I need to do to monitor things. Well, depending on how you, you do this, Zavix has an API that you can report back. Well, inside that Docker container, it doesn't necessarily know what its host name is. And so it's going to report back to that monitoring system with what it thinks its Docker container host name is. Monitoring system is not going to understand what that is at all. And so it's just like, it's this kind of slew of very practical problems that you can work through. But if you, uh, if you don't know that they're coming, that's going to add a lot of time to your first deployment where, where you, you know, learn all that stuff the hard way. So that's really all I was saying. I mean, that's any, any big migration. Yeah, and I think it's 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 not going to be surprising, but if you if you go into treating Docker containers as though they are virtual machines, um, you're gonna you're gonna get tripped up I think, if they're not. They they are different. I, I actually like them quite a bit. I've worked in environments in the past where I had virtual machines that were getting very old and they had uh, kernel vulnerabilities and everything else on them, but I couldn't log in to see what the heck was going on, and it's just a big mess. Whereas with containers. As root on the system, you have full access to all the pits and things. I can enter a container at any time. It's it's actually a, uh, from the operation side, you know, uh, some uh, it's less now, but you know, operators tend to be uh, nervous about changes like this. But this is a, a big uh, a big benefit, especially in large environments where you've got uh, you know, application code coming from all. You can always go in and run an S trace and, and see what's in the container. You can check out versions and things. Very helpful. Any other questions? Yes. So okay, so, um, okay. So I'm going to ignore the kernel part of that, just because 
Uh, I don't, I, I think that I, you may see them if there's demand for them, but I think that the best practice is that if you have, I think the best practice is going to be if you have the application created properly, that the loss of a host isn't going to matter very much. And so you, so the reboot is, is an intentional part of that. It's sort of a clean slate wipe. Whereas, you know, with something like Puppet or regular updates, You've got these machines that could be, you know, the, the actual operating system may have gone from RHEL 6 to RHEL 7 at some point. It's got all this cruff left over. Uh, Atomic and both, you know, if you're using the Docker file uh, scenarios, both of those scenarios basically bring up a clean slate every time. And I think that's a, that's a big feature. It's a forcing function to do that. Uh, so in terms of actually not needing to reboot an Atomic host, I'm not aware of anyone looking for that. Yeah. Um, the, but the entire point of Atomic is that you are in a known state. You are either in state one or state two. The you're not somewhere in between that. If you do online updates, you're stuck in possibly some unknown state. So uh, something the guarantees that Atomic provides can't be done if you do it online. And I think one one thing I didn't point out that uh, I meant to actually <coughs> been in my notes, but then if you go back through all these scenarios where I did the rolling deployments and the uh, uh, red and black deployments. I didn't actually ever really specify whether or not this was an atomic host or a Docker container. And that was very intentional, because this, when you're using an atomic host or a Docker container, you can apply that same policy, different commands obviously, but the policy can be the same, <coughs> which is a really powerful union of containers and operating systems, and it's uh, uh, something I think that a lot of operators will like, just because of what John just said. That you get that good known state both at the operating system layer and at the container layer. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Are there any um, examples of like well documented case studies for large scale solutions that use Docker um, that are worth looking at? Those examples? That's a good question. I have had several, I would call fireside chats uh, with people that, that, that have large container deployments. Obviously, Google has a whole lot of container deployments. So if you find some Google employee, talk to them about it. Um, in terms of a good uh, uh, case study, actually, you know what? I, I don't know that this is the case, but if you go to OpenShift Online, uh, I know that our product managers are real big on getting uh, user success stories from banks and things. Mm -hmm. um, I would bet they would have something there. I don't know how technical it would be, but that's a good place to start. And um, that would probably be a good blog post, too. And I'll have to go back and look and see some good examples there. Yep. Were they using uh, this micro and Betsy and all of them, right? This is, uh, were they doing uh, LXC or? Take a look at, uh, what's their right? Code is a craft.com. It's their Etsy. They got a home page for all that stuff. Since they got a garbage collection problem, I assume <laughs> that they are generating it themselves. Well, <laughs> Dagger, Dagger will do that for you. Be not careful. So. All right, any others before I hold it up? I'll be around all week, so feel free to. I love talking about this stuff academically and pragmatically, so uh, feel free to run me down, call me an idiot, or ask me a question. Anything. So, thanks, everybody. <laughs>